Well, we're talking about the power of rest, and uh, you saw the beautiful ocean. It is nice to take a vacation, but really, in the earth realm, people take vacations to take a break from the, uh, what you want to say, the the struggle, if you will. And uh, people live life in the earth realm, living to Friday to Friday, and vacation to vacation, and then looking to retirement, uh, because everyone's in the rat race. And the Bible calls that the earth curse system. I call it that. And so I want to just review some things. Before I do, though, I want to recognize this. We've had 470 people say yes to God here in six weeks. People are hungry. Amen. Who wouldn't say yes to God when you find out how good he is? I mean, who wouldn't say yes? No one. He's totally awesome. And uh, 3,000 on the weekends. And so we're looking forward to that new facility. We're kind of maxing this one out, so anyway, God is, he's a provider. What's our keynote scripture? Now, before I go through here, if you're visiting, please, you can get all the rest of the series. This is number seven in this, in this series. You can get to the, uh, the bookstore or online and get the rest of this material because it is life-changing, absolutely life-changing. And we're going to ask our attendees questions, and if you're visiting, you can help me. Uh, the, the ones that have been attending should have answers. And if they're not, say, what's wrong? You don't know that one? No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> but uh, you really, you want to know it. Hebrews chapter 4, verse 9 is our key scripture for the series. Let's jump into it right now. It says, there remains then a Sabbath rest for the people of God. And who would that be? That'd be you. For anyone who enters God's rest, also rest from his own work, just as God did his. I'm going to do a really brief, quick review for everyone. But essentially... Sabbath rest is not Old Testament. This is New Testament. Sabbath rest, we have to define our terms. What is that talking about? Sabbath rest. Well, Adam and Eve had the whole thing. They had the Garden of Eden. They had everything, and Satan deceived Adam out of the kingdom. He rebelled against God. He lost his position in the kingdom, lost the Garden of Eden, lost the provision of God, and God said, now, Adam, by your own painful toil and sweat, you'll have to make your way through life, and that's how life has been since then. Now, God gave Adam a picture of what he would someday restore back to man, which is called the Sabbath day, the Sabbath day. Now, what could they not do on the Sabbath day? They were forbidden to work on the Sabbath day, yet they had plenty of food, and God was giving them a picture of what he was going to restore, which is full provision, and a way of life beyond this painful toil and sweat system of survival. That's where people live today, in survival. And so there remains then a Sabbath rest for the people of God, for anyone who enters God's rest. Entering God's rest, what does that mean? When God created the earth in six days, he rested. But he wasn't tired. He was finished because he had completed the earth. So you're doing well, you're doing well. He finished, he wasn't tired. And so anyone who enters into God's rest means you enter into that finished, complete work of everything that you have need of that Jesus has restored back to you. And when you do so, it says you can rest from your own painful toil and sweat. Now, in the Old Testament, they had the Sabbath day, of course, and we learned that Jesus is our Sabbath. We'll look at that in just a minute. But there was also the Sabbath year. Very good. And yet they were well provided for. They had plenty of food for the entire year, yet they did not toil and sweat. And they had the year of Jubilee every 50 years, where there were three years in a row they had to have provision, yet they didn't toil or sweat. They didn't sow their crops, yet they're well provided for. And let's find out what the Bible says about these examples. We find that in Colossians Colossians 2, 16. Say it, Colossians 2, 16. Have you ever asked someone what they believe, or they say, my church doesn't believe that way? You ever heard that before? Or I don't believe like you believe? And I always say, if you just take your Bible and hand it to them and say, well, show me what you believe, most people are just blank because they've been told what they believe. I don't want that for Faith Life Church. I want people who know what they believe and know where to find it. So Colossians 2.16 talks about the Sabbath. Denominations fight over the Sabbath, friend. But we're going to find out, and we have found out, what the Sabbath is. In Colossians 2.16, again, this is a quick review, but we're going to read this scripture 
every week just to reemphasize what we have our hands on. Colossians 2.16 says this, Therefore, do not let anyone judge you by what you eat or drink or with regard to a religious festival, a new moon celebration, or a Sabbath day. These are a shadow. You're doing really well. Yeah, I'm, man, you're learning, man. When I do this, you're supposed to say something. You're getting it, right? Okay. New moon celebration or Sabbath day. These are a shadow of the things that were to come. The reality, however, is found in Christ. So the Sabbath day was only a picture of what was to come. There was no power in it. There was no power to set you free in it. It was just a picture, like I've been saying. It's like a picture of Oreos. Looks great. Can't eat it. The Sabbath day was a picture, a shadow of what was to come. You have the reality. So what does the picture tell you? There's a way of escape above the earth curse system of painful toil and sweat because they weren't allowed to painfully toil and sweat on the Sabbath day. The Sabbath year, entire year without toiling, yet they're well provided for. The year of Jubilee, three years, as I said. Follow Jesus' ministry. He did things above the earth realms, a natural way of doing things. Lazarus, come forth, come out of the grave, right? I mean, Peter, James, and John, two boats. They've been fishing all night, caught nothing. But now, by the kingdom, the boats are about sinking with fish. How did that happen? 5,000 men being fed by five loaves and two fish. How did that happen? Everyone say the kingdom. The kingdom is a different way of living. It does not match the earth curse system of your custom way of life. It is a new way of life. So Jesus is telling us about it. Now, your question should be right now, as spiritual scientists, the Sabbath rest is yours. We found that out in New Testament, right? Everyone knows that you have the Sabbath rest. All right? You have it. So how do I enter into that? That's your next question. Again, this is review. How do I tap into the Sabbath rest? Exodus chapter 16. Now, of course, there's two sides to this, but let's read Exodus 16 first. This is review. This is regarding the manna. Nevertheless, some of the people went out on the seventh day to gather it, but they found no manna. Then the Lord said to Moses, How long will you refuse to keep my commands and my instructions? Bear in mind that the Lord has given you the Sabbath. That is why on the sixth day he gives you bread for two days. Two days, we call that the double portion. Now, could they have a Sabbath rest if there was no double portion? No, why? Because they'd be hungry on the seventh day. What about the sixth year, the the Sabbath year, an entire year without sowing crops? They would be hungry, except the sixth year provided enough to last two years, a double portion. The year of Jubilee, they couldn't sow their crops for two years in a row and had to wait for the crops to mature, basically three years. The 48th year, remember the year of Jubilee is every 50 years, and so the 49th year is a Sabbath year. So how, is that, how, do they, how do they survive? Well, the 48th year provided so much, it lasted for those 49th, 50, and 51st year. Now, again, as I've been saying throughout this series, that's the shadow, that's the picture, that's the glossy print in the magazine, if you will. But you have the real deal. But if, pastor, if that's true, Pastor, then why are so many people that are Christians not living like that? And I would agree, they're not. And that's why we're talking about this. So the Sabbath rest is only possible by the, get it, the double portion. Now your next question is, how do I tap into the double portion, right? All right very good, thank you. John chapter 6, verse number 12, 11 and 12, review again. This is of the multiplication of the bread. Jesus then took the loaves, gave thanks, distributed to those who were seated as much as they wanted. He did the same with the fish. When they all had enough to eat, he said to the disciples, gather the pieces that are left over, let nothing be wasted. In our series, we have made evident to you that God is very passionate about let nothing be wasted. We talked about the double portion, the year of Jubilee, Isaiah 61. You can go back and review, but God does not like you living in the earth curse system of struggle and survival because he has provided for you the seventh day. Let me say it this way. Jesus is the Sabbath rest. The Sabbath rest is no longer a day. You got that. 
Jesus is the Sabbath. He is the year of Jubilee. He's the Sabbath year, the Sabbath day. He is the Sabbath. The seventh day has been re- re- returned to you, the church. But Christians don't know about that. They get caught up in their religious view of things. But these are all a picture. We've got to, what is it telling us, okay? We've got to get that in our spirits here. So let nothing be wasted. God wants you to have it. He wants you to have the double portion. He wants to bring you out from under the curse of the earth curse. He wants to bring you into a place of influence. He, he wants you to have the provision you need. It's provided for you. Legally, it's already yours. So Jesus, in this story, we find the double portion. These guys were satisfied with being satisfied. And Jesus had to tell them, let nothing be wasted. Pick the fragments up. And there were 12 baskets of bread and fish left over, which was more than they started with. That's the double portion. Double portion does not mean two of something. It means more than enough. Okay, you got it? Got it. Good. Now, Jesus had to tell them to pick up the fragments. And again, we talked about this last week in great detail, but the way we were raised in the earth curse system, we work to stop. Slaves work to stop. Survivalists work to stop. As I said earlier, we aim at Friday night. We aim at vacation. We aim at retirement. Because in the earth curse system, we're all trying to be satisfied, and satisfied people don't think past satisfied. And one of the keys we said is, until you begin to think different, past satisfied, you'll not be able to pick up where the double portion's at. They were stepping on the fragments. They were walking all over the fragments, but Jesus had to tell them to pick it up. I would guarantee, now, God never supplies just enough. Never. That's not his nature at all. He always supplies the double portion. Always more than enough. Given it shall be given unto you, good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over. That sounds like waste. Running over. But I don't need running over. I just need what I need. Well, have you ever thought it's not all about you? (laughs) It's all about God. He has stuff he wants to get done. And 2 Corinthians chapter 9 says that your life should be able to be generous on every occasion. That does not happen, friend. You have to have more than enough to do that. The Bible says you're to be the head, not the tail, the lender, not the borrower. I mean, this we've gone through this. Yet why are so many believers not living like that? Because they do not know they have the seventh day given back to them. So we're going through it. You have to see past satisfied to see the double portion. Again, our problem is not that we just don't see the double portion. The problem in the church is we didn't know to look for a double portion. Well, now you do. God never sends provision, only for today. He sends the double portion. So here's an email that we received from James and Ella. They're members of our church. You may know them. I got this last week, and I told James, he was here last service, and James now, they're in dream teams right now. They're, they're out there working in the, in the children's church. I said, James, I'm going to let you preach today. I'm going to preach it for you, but I'm reading your, I'm teaching what you, you sent me. I'm going to preach from your notes. Here's his email. Since attending FLC, it has been a game changer in our lives. We're excited for 2018. Soon after you started your latest series, The Power of Rest, it has caused us to think differently. Anyone else say that's true? Yeah, I hope so. We'll stay here till it does. <laughs> and we decided to stand in agreement for $10,000. Now, he says we didn't need the money. We didn't have to have it. We we're not desperately in need for the money. But they're, they're wanting to test the kingdom. They're hearing the kingdom. And they're like, let's just believe, let's believe God for $10,000. I mean, who couldn't use $10,000 is what he says. All right. So they sowed a seed at the beginning of January. As the days turned into weeks, nothing seemed to change but we continue to stand in agreement. In the middle of January, we enjoyed a vacation to Cancun. Listen to this. While on vacation, we spent quite a bit of time putting into focus this $10,000, which included scriptures, and also discussing how we'll use the funds to sow more seed and the things we want to do with the $10,000. They're not talking about parasailing. They're on vacation talking about the kingdom. 
Pay close attention. There's some keys here. We came home back to Ohio, and nothing had changed. Several more weeks passed with what seemed very little difference, but we continued to speak our, about our blessing, about the covenant, our expectancy, something else we've learned from your teaching. By January 31st, we'd heard enough about this double portion thing that we finally considered that maybe the Spirit of God was saying something to us. What would he be saying to them? There's more. There's more. So my wife and I discussed it at length and concluded that 10,000 is awesome, but let's go for the double portion and believe God for 20,000. The very next day, an older gentleman by the name of Gary, wasn't me, of course, <laughs> whom I've known for 8 to 10 years, stopped by my shop to discuss the repairs we were performing on his vehicle. Uh, James is a mechanic. As he sat in my office explaining his past six to eight weeks of frustration he had with raising his cattle and all the broken fencing, and at his advanced age, he said he'd had enough of it, he looked at me and informed me effective immediately I was the new owner of a herd of 23 black Angus cattle along with two horses. <laughs> now, <clears throat> make a long story short, James sold that herd for how much? Guess, just guess. 20,000 even. Now, all spiritual scientists should be asking lots of questions, right? How'd that happen? I mean, when's the last time someone walked up to you and gave you seven or 27 whatever with cows? <laughs> when you're a mechanic and have a half acre in the city. Listen to me closely. He has a half acre in the city. He's a mechanic. Typically, what would happen? Oh, no, thank you. I, can't, I couldn't eat that much. I'm not a farmer. I have half acre. I'm a mechanic. What would I do with cows? Right? But now you think different, right? You're always open. You're expectant. And he was expectant. And he, we'll, talk, we'll finish his story later, but he sold over $20,000. Now, I'm sure that James has had an experience with the kingdom providing, satisfied before, but this is, I'm guessing, the first time he has seen visible evidence of the double portion clearly in his life. I mean, clearly evidenced. And why is God doing that? Because he's trying to tell James, remember he said that God was dealing with us? He's trying to tell them, hey guys, lift your eyes. There's more. There's more. You've got to think different. There's more. All right? Are you with me? Okay. So again, review, just a little bit of review here. Why do we not naturally see the double portion? Besides our mindset, which doesn't see it, it's also hidden. We talked about this, Luke chapter 8, verse 10. Jesus, of course, in the Bible tells stories, and then he interprets the story to his disciples. And if you're like me, I would always say, just make it clear. Forget the story. Just tell me what you're trying to tell me, right? But he had a reason why he did that, and it says right here in Luke chapter 8, verse 10, he said, the knowledge of the secrets of the kingdom of God has been given to you. Wow, that'll change your life right there. The secrets of the kingdom of God are yours, to know. To others I speak in parables, so that those seeing they may not see, and though hearing they may not understand, meaning they're not on God's team. God's going to hide his secrets from people who don't know, will misuse them, but people that have ears to hear from the Spirit of God will pick up on them and will find the secrets they need. So we've always said it is hidden from you, for you, very good, you're getting good. So how do we see the double portion? In this series, we have discussed several stories and pointed out the double portion. As a spiritual scientist, now if you're new to Faith Life Church, you'll hear me say that quite a bit because the kingdom is a kingdom based on laws. So I, I try to get my people to stop thinking uh, outside that God's sovereign, does whatever he wants. Now I hear this a lot, God is sovereign. But you'll hear this sovereign thing spoken like this when something bad happens. Well, God is sovereign. He knows what's best. He could have stopped it. He allowed it. Whatever. You may have heard that. Well, you need to understand the truth about that. God is sovereign, and he sovereignly gave man the jurisdiction over the earth realm. Isaiah 61 says, The Spirit of the sovereign Lord is on me, speaking of Jesus. He has anointed me to preach good news to the poor. And he goes on and lists more things there, of course. But... 
the sovereign Lord has given us citizenship in his kingdom. We are part of his household. He's given us healing, given us the benefits of his kingdom, all the benefits, uh, all the provision of his kingdom. He's sovereign. He chose to do that. But, of course, if you don't know who he is and what his word says, you might fall into that trap that you'll hear out there and even on Christian radio that says, God is sovereign. He killed that person with cancer. He could have healed them, but he allowed them to die. Friend, if you ever, ever, ever believe that lie, you will think that God is not good. And that's why the devil propagates that lie. So people will think God is not trustworthy. He is not good. He has the power to do something that he chooses not to do. And that is not true. James says this. The book of James says, do not be deceived, but every good and perfect gift comes from God. That has to be settled because if you think that God can do something like that, you cannot receive from him. You'll not put your confidence in him. And so it's, you have to have this God is only good all the time settled once and for all to be able to decipher correct theology from that point on. I, I, could, I need to spend maybe a few, few weeks on that, but just understand that God is good. The Bible says it's impossible for him to tempt men with evil. It's impossible. He is always good. And he has given us his word, his precious promises that tell us his will towards us. And so we can rest in that fact. If there is a mix-up with your circumstances that don't match what God has said, you need to ask questions. So when I say a spiritual scientist, I'm trying to get people to ask questions. Why did that happen? There's legal, spiritual reasons why that happened. In Mark chapter 6, I haven't, this is kind of a rabbit trail, but I feel someone needs to hear this today. Mark chapter 6, it says, Jesus could not heal the people. Now, if I told people that in the Bible there's a spot that it says Jesus could not heal them, they would say, no, there's not. Yes, there is. No, there's not. Yes, there is. Mark chapter 6. It says he could not heal them because of their unbelief. Their unbelief. Now, we could spend a whole day teaching on why is belief or faith necessary? Why, was, why would unbelief cut the power of God off in the earth realm? You have to know those answers. And we have a lot of great material on that in the bookstore to help you understand how the kingdom operates. So when I tell the church as a spiritual scientist, we want to ask questions. I'm trying to train you to ask questions. Why did that happen? Why was that person not healed? Why was that person healed? Why did those fish show up? Why did those boats almost sink? Why did that happen? Because there are answers for those questions. All right, let's move on. So in the stories we've read, we need to answer the question, how do I find where the double portion's at? Jesus had to tell them, pick up the fragments. They didn't see it. He had to say, hey, listen, guys, let nothing be wasted. Pick the fragments up, and there were 12 baskets left over. That's the double portion, more than enough. That's the 12 baskets. That's more than they started with. All right, so let's move on. So we talked about stories. Go back to the manna story, Israel with the manna. How did they know to pick up twice the amount on the sixth day? Moses had to tell them. How did the disciples know to pick the fragments up? Jesus had to tell them. In the two boats, the story of the fishermen, Peter, James, and John, fishing all night, catching nothing. And then Jesus using the boat, and he says, go out into the deep water. Remember? Two boats about sank. How did that happen? That's more than enough. That's the double portion. Because what? Jesus told them where the fish were. What about feeding the 5,000? They had five loaves and two fish. Jesus gave them a plan. He blessed it. They multiplied. He said, pass it out. Sit in groups. Impossible situation. Jesus told them how to handle it. Are you getting a, a pattern? Okay. When Peter had taxes to pay, the temple tax... He came to Jesus, and Jesus gave him very specific instructions. Go to the lake, cast a line, catch a fish, the first fish in its mouth, find a coin, pay your tax and mine. That's the double portion. How did that happen? Jesus told him exactly what to do and where to go. Here's one we haven't read yet, John chapter 2, verse number 1. On the third day, a wedding took place at Cana in Galilee. Jesus' mother was there, and Jesus and his disciples had also been invited to the wedding. Also been invited. So I'm assuming Mary, his mom, is the wedding coordinator. I'm assuming so. When the wine was gone, his mother said to him, they have no more wine. 
Woman, why do you involve me? Jesus said, my hour has not yet come. His mother said to the servants, what? Do whatever he says. Nearby stood six stone water jars, the kind used by the Jews for ceremonial washing, each holding from 20 to 30 gallons. Jesus said to the servants, fill the jars with water. So they filled them to the brim. Uh, He said, now draw some out and take it to the master of the banquet. They did so, and the master of the banquet tasted the water that had been turned into wine. He did not realize where it had come from, though the servants who had drawn the water knew. Then he called the bridegroom aside and said, everyone brings out the choice wine first, and then the cheaper wine after the guests have had too much to drink, but you have saved the best until now. Now, if you take 30 jugs, excuse me, six jugs, the size of those jugs, and you convert that to a bottle of wine in our society, that would be 938 bottles of wine. That's a lot of wine. And it's the best wine, which again is the double portion. They've already been drinking already wine, but now they have 938 bottles of the best wine. That's more than enough. That's the double portion. God always, always, always operates in more than enough. Just get the picture. All right? So the common factor in all of these stories, how did they tap into the more than enough? Help me out. They had to be told where it was. It had to be revealed to them. All right? Now today, that was all introduction, by the way. (laughs) Today's lesson is, all right, if that's true, to tap into the double portion, I need to know how to receive revelation or revealed. Revelation means revealed. I need to be able to hear or know how to receive that revealing of where it's at. I mean, obviously, Jesus isn't here in person to tell me, so we need to talk about that. Fair enough? Now, speaking of revelation, the Bible, of course, is is revelation. But the Bible is not specific revelation for today's decisions, meaning it doesn't tell you where to live, who to marry, uh, to buy or sell stock, uh, what to do in your occupation. There's a lot of questions about life that the Bible doesn't clearly tell you. It tells you principles, laws, and the kingdom so you can get this information. But in itself, it doesn't say on page three, Gary, you are to marry Drenda. Right? And how many realize you need to know the answers? People need to know. In fact, the greatest question we get as pastors is, what am I supposed to do? Well, hang on. We're going to find out. The best chapter in the Bible discussing Revelation and how to hear it is 1 Corinthians chapter 2. Paul is teaching here a concept that is life-changing, life-changing. Verse number 6, we'll start in the chapter, verse number 6, Paul speaking, we do, however, speak a message of wisdom among the mature, but not the wisdom of this age or of the rulers of this age who are coming to nothing. No, we speak of God's, what, secret wisdom, a wisdom that has been what? hidden and that God destined for our glory. Now we just read, of course, that the secrets of the kingdom of God are destined for you to know, but they've been hidden, all right? And that God has destined this knowledge for our glory. None of the rulers of this age understood it, for if they had, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. Satan would never have killed Jesus if he would have understood the plan of God. Understand this, you have a plan, God has a plan for you. And if Satan can pick up on it, as we see here, he can change tactics. That's what this is saying. He would change tactics if he understood, right? Do you see that? So he's watching your life, demons, they're assigned to watch you. Uh, He's always trying to figure it out. The Bible says he lives within the kingdom of darkness. He has to guess at what God is doing. But one thing you can understand is once revelation comes to you, he picks up on it. It's no longer hidden. When you start talking and blabbing and, you know, you got to be careful. That's why, remember John the Baptist? Zacharias, his father, went into the temple. Remember that? He didn't believe the angel. And the angel said, because you didn't believe about John the Baptist being born to you, you'll not be able to speak until the day John is born. Why? Because he would mess it up. He would reveal the plan. So the angel had to shut his mouth so that The devil would not pick up on what God was doing. All right, just a word of advice there. Be careful. All right, so we'll move on down through here. None of the rulers of this age understood it, for if they had, they would have not have crucified the Lord of glory. However, as it is written, no eye has seen, no ear has heard, no mind has conceived what God has prepared for those who love him. Next verse. 
What's that word right there? But God has revealed it to who? By his spirit, capital S. What has he revealed to you? Things you've not seen, things you've not heard and thought. That's pretty important stuff. That's what you need to know to win in life. Otherwise, you're going to lean to your own understanding, your own experiences, and you need to know how to tap into the mind of Christ to learn what God knows. Amen. Well, it's been given to you. That's, do you all see that in your Bible? That's what it says. It says, these things have been revealed to you. The Spirit searches all things, even the deep things of God, for who among men knows the thoughts of a man except the man's spirit? Now, we've got to stop here because this is vital. You are three parts, according to Thessalonians, spirit, soul, and body. Your spirit is the God part of you. Your soul realm is your personality, your mind, will, and emotions. It's who you are as a person. Then you live in a body. Everyone got it? All right. So he says the man's spirit, who knows the thoughts of a man except the man's spirit? So your mind, your thoughts are very closely tied to, connected to your spirit. In fact, you can't tell the difference. In Hebrews, it says the word of God is living and active, dividing between soul and spirit. Because you can't, they're the same to you. Your thoughts, you know, your mind, your, your, it's just all tied together. You can't clearly define the, the dividing line, okay? In the same way, no one knows the thoughts of God except the spirit of God. Now, where's the spirit of God dwell on the earth today? In temples made of hand? Like the old days? Like the tabernacle that traversed the wilderness? Where does the Holy Spirit dwell today? You are, the Bible says, the temple of the Holy Spirit. When you were born again, the Bible says, your spirit became one with God's spirit. And the Holy Spirit indwelt you and became one with your spirit. So if the spirit of God knows the thoughts of God and he is now connected to your spirit and your spirit is closely tied to your thoughts, guess what you now have access to? The thoughts of God. Hello, come on. All right, that's what the Bible says. We have not received the spirit of the world, but the spirit who is from God, that we may, and underline this please, you've received the spirit of God when you were born again, that we may what? Understand what God has freely given to us. Understand. Understand. The Spirit of God is trying to help you understand, bring revelation, revealing to you of the kingdom, what God has given you in Jesus. And uh, in first chapter of Ephesians, Paul prays for the church at Ephesus that the eyes of their understanding may be opened, that they would be able to understand of this never-ending, this enormous limitless potential they have in Christ. All right. Verse 13. This is what we speak, not in words taught us by human wisdom, but in words taught by the Spirit of God, expressing spiritual truths in spiritual words. Now, we have to define that. Spiritual truths in spiritual words. The Spirit of God um, is bringing revelation, understanding of what God has freely given us. But this revelation is spoken by us. Follow me now. Go back up to verse 12. We have not received the spirit of the world, but the spirit who is from God, that we may understand what God has freely given us. This revelation from the spirit of God is what we speak, not in words taught by human wisdom, but in words taught by the spirit of God himself, expressing spiritual truths, things we didn't know, revelation, in spiritual words. Do you see that? I need revelation. So I need to know what these spiritual words are that I'm expressing. Did you see that? This revelation we speak in spiritual words. Everyone see that? You haven't convinced me. I'll start over. All right, so to understand this, let's move to 1 Corinthians chapter 14. Chapter 14, we'll come back to chapter 2 here in a second. Verse number 1. Follow the way of love and eagerly desire spiritual gifts, especially the gift of prophecy. For anyone who speaks in a tongue does not speak to men but to God, 
Indeed, no one understands him. He utters mysteries with his spirit. Now, there are nine spiritual gifts in the church, given to the church. Nine spiritual gifts. Uh, here we see prophecy listed. We see praying in tongues or basically a language you don't know. Uh, list, there's many more gifts of healing, you know, faith, wisdom. There's a lot of gifts there listed. And you may hear people say, well, you know, I have the gift of blank. Well, no, that's not actually proper. You have the Holy Spirit, thus you have all nine of them. Okay? Now, you will see people that have different assignments and callings operating in different giftings with a more regular, um, you know, see it happen more often. It goes along with their assignment. But essentially, all nine spiritual gifts are yours. In fact, the Bible says to eagerly desire spiritual gifts. The gifts are of the Spirit, which we may dig into those with a, with a series sometime, but the gifts of the Spirit are for your advantage, for you to win against the devil, and you are to eagerly desire them. They're not something spooky. A lot of churches teach they've passed away, but that is not true unless you rip out 1 Corinthians 12, 13, and 14, and a few other chapters, because 12, 13, and 14 are all about the gifts of the Spirit. You say, oh, no, they're not. 13's about the, it's the love chapter. Yeah, it begins, though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels. You know, Vice President Pence got in trouble saying he speaks to Jesus. What are your friends going to say when they find out you speak the tongue of angels? <laughs> CNN might like that. <laughs> Speaking the tongues of angels, languages you don't know, is called speaking in tongues. Now, relax. I grew up in a church that said that was passed away, but my friend, it is not passed away. You need spiritual gifts. Now, let's look at this again. Paul says to desire prophecy because he's dealing with the church assembly. The church at Corinth has been uh, just newly baptized in the Holy Spirit. They had these nine spiritual gifts functioning, and they're all prideful, and they're all judging each other who's more spiritual by the gifts they operate in. They're all praying in tongues, and Paul's coming in there and says, look, you guys, this is all confusion. In the church, it'd be better for you to prophesy so people understand what you're saying, is what he's basically saying. He says, anyone who speaks in a tongue does not speak to men but to God. Indeed, no one understands him. But listen to this. He utters mysteries with his spirit. Little less, his spirit. So we've got to answer a question. How did mysteries get in your spirit? Something you never knew before, you now have in your spirit. How did that happen? Because the Holy Spirit is one with your spirit, all right? But everyone who prophesies speaks to men for their strengthening, encouragement, and comfort. But he who speaks in a tongue edifies himself. The word edify means bring instruction or revelation. Remember in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, that's what we were talking about, is that you may know, you may have understanding, you need instruction, specific instruction. It comes by the Holy Spirit. And praying in the Spirit, as we we're going to find here, praying in tongues is a way to tap into that. But he who prophesies edifies the church. Paul says, I would like every one of you to speak in tongues. Now, why did he say that? Because the church is all praying in tongues in Corinth, but he's trying to bring order to their service. And he says, listen, I'd rather you all speak in tongues, but it'd be better if you prophesy so people understand what you're saying. That's all he's saying. You got it? All right. Now, Let's jump over to 1 Corinthians 14, 14. For if I pray in a tongue, my spirit prays, but my mind is unfruitful, so what shall I do? I will pray with my spirit, but I will also pray with the understanding, or my mind, in English. I will sing with my spirit, but I will also sing with my mind. Now here he's referencing what he called there in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, spiritual words. We speak spiritual words. Here he's talking about praying in the Spirit and praying in English, or th with the understanding as two separate things. He's referencing there in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, praying in tongues. Praying in tongues, and let me explain why here in just a minute. Verse 18, Paul says, I thank God that I speak in tongues more than all of you, because he's bringing correction. He's saying, listen, I'm not saying, he's saying, he's not saying, let me see, I don't want to say that. He is, he's bringing correction, and so before he corrects them on speaking in tongues, he says, 
I'm glad I speak in tongues more than all of you, but here's how you should do it, essentially. He's saying, don't stop praying in the Spirit, but he's bringing direction. And he's talking about, again, prophesying. And look here at verse 18. I thank God that I speak in tongues more than all of you, but in the church, in the church, I'd rather speak five intelligible words to instruct others than 10,000 words in a tongue. So he's not saying not to pray in tongues. He just said he's glad he prays in tongues more than all of the people there, right? But he says, in the church, in the church assembly. Now, Paul's part of the church, is he not? He's a member of the church. So he's talking about in the church assembly. It's best to prophesy so people understand what you're saying instead of 200, 1,000 people all just start praying in tongues and no one knows what's going on. That's essentially what, what he's saying. You've got that? All right. Here's the key about speaking in tongues. Satan has no clue what you're saying. So praying in the Spirit, praying in the Spirit, God's Spirit, one with your spirit, prays, Romans 8 says, always prays the perfect will of God through your spirit. God prays through your spirit, and so as the Holy Spirit is praying through your spirit, and you're speaking words, you don't understand what you're saying. Neither does the devil. He doesn't know what you're saying. But as you're praying through your spirit, the Bible says your spirit is closely tied to your mind. And as you're praying in the spirit, these thoughts are flowing through from God's spirit to your spirit. And some of those thoughts bubble up into your consciousness, and that's called revelation. Got it? That's called revelation. So to walk in this ability to discern where the Sabbath rest is at, the double portion, will require you to be able to hear the Spirit of God and to follow the Spirit of God. And God will speak to you and bring revelation to you of where it's at and to enact a plan to capture it. Is that making sense? Okay, y'all got really quiet. I know I talk fast, but we have a book in the bookstore called The Baptism of the Holy Spirit. It's free. You can pick it up on the way out, and it'll explain a lot about what we just discussed, okay? But this is vital to tap into the Sabbath rest. So going back to James and Ella's story, once they found the cattle, that wasn't the whole story. You see, as I said, James was a mechanic. He didn't have any land but a half acre, and the cattle... I didn't mention this yet, we're roaming wild on 14,000 acres of state land. Mm -hmm. No wonder the guy said you can have them. So here's 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 the lesson. The lesson is that as the Holy Spirit gives you a direction, shows you an opportunity, you still have your part to play in devising a plan to capture that. He had to find a buyer for the cattle. And he had to go catch the cattle and then move them to the the purchaser's farm. And so that wasn't necessarily easy with them roaming wild. But he engaged the process, and he has the 20,000. You follow that? So the Holy Spirit will illuminate a direction, a plan, an idea, but you still have to engage the process to harvest that opportunity. It's not going to just show up in your mailbox. Hey, someone sold 27 cattle for us, and here's the check. I didn't know we had 27 cattle. That's not going to happen that way. You're going to know what you're involved with. Amen? All right. Let's see what we're at here. So you have to look. I'm just, you have, your mind has to look. You have to be open like James was. Not a farmer? Why? I don't have any cattle. I don't do have cattle. I'm a mechanic. I have half acre, right? You got to think different. What happens if you're a fisherman and God says, go catch a fish and you'll find a coin in its mouth? Well, why didn't I think of that? I mean, you know, that's, <laughs> I mean you've got to be open, man, because the Holy Spirit's going to give you some strange concepts, right? Gary and Drinda Cassie, you know, poster kids, nine years seriously in debt. I know, why don't you start a company helping people get out of debt? Wonderful, why didn't I think of that? <laughs> Which we did. <laughs> so you have to be open. For instance, if I told you there's a $100 bill under someone's chair right now, you'd probably go, oh, right. Gary's not going to put a $100 bill in someone's chair right now. I mean, that's crazy stuff. Why would I take the time to get up and move in the auditorium? That's rude. That's, that's abrupt. That's not going to, and he wouldn't want that to happen. I mean, I'm in church, don't you know? 
I mean, this is crazy stuff. This is disorder. You know, God would not do it that way. It would show up in my mailbox, and you have it. Very good, Linda. Yeah. But you were nervous at first. No, I'm serious. You're nervous. Like, should we move? I mean, this is church. I mean, this isn't holy. I mean, it's right in the middle of his message. I mean, this is out of order. You got all nervous. <laughs> right? But you got to look. What? Oh, you found it. You found it? Did, Lynn, did you find it? What? How much is in there? How much is in that envelope, Linda? 100. How much is in yours? 100. So, yeah, we got two out there. <laughs> Anyone else find any? All right, so we got to wrap this. We got we to we keep, keep moving. So my, my objective as your pastor is, and God is speaking to us. I told you the, all the stories that he was making it very clear. Uh, you heard about the, the deer hunting, you know, episodes and the car and the house and all the things. Shotguns kept showing up, you know, and all the, in twos, pairs, kept showing up in pairs and pairs and pairs and pairs. And uh, God was trying to get my attention about the double portion like he did James. Hey, James, raise your vision. Let's go for 20. And he kept showing us that. And remember a few weeks back, uh, someone sent me two shotguns. They always come in pairs, two shotguns. I showed you the shotguns. Beautiful. Thousands of dollars. And these are expensive shotguns. And they keep coming. I have a whole bunch of great shotguns. But remember, two weeks ago, I got two shotguns, and Drenda got one and $1,500 cash because she's not a shotgun person. She had the double portion. Someone just sent it in. Someone sent it to us. So I had two shotguns. She got a great shotgun that matched one of mine and $1,500. That's a double portion. And uh, if you need to know the rest of the story, in my book, I list all these things that just really catch your attention. Drenda's birthday was like a week and a half ago. I'm not, uh, yeah, when Drenda, when she got the, um, the shotgun, she opened it up, and of course it was beautiful. From a man's perspective, it was beautiful. <laughs> not as beautiful as she is, but it was beautiful as a shotgun. And it had uh, engraving on it, and so she looks at it and goes, oh, look, there's pheasants. That's cute. I would never say that about a shotgun. <laughs> Shotguns aren't cute, you know. But, and so say, same with her. I mean, you know, Drenda has all these names. She's a great shopper. She's a great shopper. Oh, I got this on sale. And she lists some name. I don't know what, I mean, I don't know the difference of, but she, she knows all these names. This, you know, this, I got this. It's normally like $3 million, and I got it for 20 and it's this name. <laughs> I mean, that's this name, you know, it looks like a dress to me. It looks like boots or something to me, but I don't know. But she knows the name means something, all right? So this past week, she received two, I got because I don't know this off the top of my head really well, Louis Vuitton purses. Now, I'm not uh, into purses, but she seemed pretty excited about it. She did not buy the purses. She's never bought herself a Louis Vuitton purse. But this week, two from two different people came in for her birthday. Now, my question to you is, why would that happen? But I know why. It's God is trying to get our attention that there's more than enough. He's trying to get our attention. Again, it's not about the material things. Please understand, it's not about the material things at all. Material things are not life. But he's using these examples to catch our attention, and we need to get the picture. Like with James. James, you got to get the picture here. God's kingdom is not short. There's plenty of provision in God's house. Let's get the job done. <laughs>